give you an overview of where Tavi has come in the last um, probably nine to ten years. Um, so there are clearly challenges with Tavi today. Parva uh, leak, permanent face makers, patient selection, I think it's a big, big issue. Uh, vascular complications, stroke, predictable implant, uh, coronary occlusion, annular rupture, ventricular perforation, and more recent, I think, valve durability has been questioned. But there are also, I think, administrative challenges with TAVI today. The overall cost, I think, is still prohibitive for a lot of centers, certainly in third world countries. Patient flow, managing uh, increasing volume is becoming a challenge. And finally, patient choice, I think, increasing those centers that are doing TAVI today will grapple with this challenge quite frequently. Patients coming to you with a volume of a TAVI and asking for that specific treatment. However, yeah, it is a standard of care, I think, for high-risk patients and inoperable patients with symptomatic severe arachnosis. The overall numbers are increasing each unit that are doing TAVI today. Increasingly, uh, the so-called moderate patients are being offered TAVI. And I think for this increase will increase uh, more driven by data and patient choice. For the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to concentrate on four uh, commonly used valves today. Uh, you see the balloon expandable Edward Sapien device, the self-expanding supraannular uh, electronic device, the St. Jude's annular portico device, and the mechanically expanded uh, Lotus device. You can see from the pictures alone, they all look very different. The functions are very different. The deployment characteristics are very different. Edward Sapien, first of all, have gone through significant changes uh, from the Sapien valve XT to the Sapien 3. And certainly when you look at how the, the valve is loaded, also we can see just on pictures again, from top to down, uh, the, the crimping size has changed, the need for access has changed significantly. So has this affected outcome when you look at global trial? I'm not gonna spend too much uh, time on the data itself, but the partner two trial um, has looked at surgery versus TAVI in uh, moderate patients. And it included actually all three valves uh, for the purpose of the duration of trial. So it gave us a good insight on what each valve specifically uh, uh, linked to outcome. I think it's quite interesting, in the US it was called a moderate trial, but the average age of population for this trial was 82, and about a fifth of patients actually had previous bypass surgery. So again, you can already see that the concept of moderate risk, I think has changed from the day this trial was presented to what we do today. This trial showed that the outcome of TAVI, at least the transfemoral outcome of TAVI with surgery was not inferior. But there were challenges with TAVI, clearly. There was uh, a fairly high event of moderate risk, moderate power valve leak, uh, with almost 8% showing evidence power valve leak at up to two years follow-up. And we know that power valve leak, at least moderate to severe, correlates quite poorly with outcome, both at short and long term. There were other significant challenges with the balloon expendable. Uh, the need for second valve was at least 2.6%. Valve embolization was noted and a rupture catastrophic event was seen in three patients. Corny obstruction and exercise uh, infections were again seen as challenges. So the Sapien 3 valve has been developed. It is unique in that uh, it has an external skirt uh, and that allows um, the, the device to take on power valve leak. And it also, uh, the delivery system also is able to bend in two points, uh, one at the annular point and one at the arch allowing for us to position and deploy the valve a little better. And this has resulted in significant drop in power of leak from 8% up to 3.5% at 30 day follow up. And when we looked at more detailed analysis of outcome towards, or power of leak outcome towards uh, sizing, it was seen that, and similar to other devices, if you oversize the valve by uh, 0 to 5%, 5 to 10 percent and the more oversizing you put into the sizing of the valve the better was the outcome however you need to um, balance that to a potential risk of annual rupture if you oversize it too much um, and mass uh, vascular complication again significantly dropped from the uh, double digit to single digit again due to the low profile of the device and when you look at overall 30-day outcome compared to the early trials significantly lower now uh, with the Sapien 3. But perhaps it's because we are getting better at selecting the patients. Uh, certainly if you look at the STS score from the early trials to what we did now, uh, an STS score of 11.6 right down to 5.2. So perhaps patient selection has played a significant role as well on how uh, TAVI has improved over time. 
but that is perhaps something to give up. So when you put a skirt around a valve, there's more interaction at the annular plane. And what uh, people have seen and what we have seen is that there's marginally increased the need for pacemaker uh, even in the uh, sapient technology. But by better technique, we've gone back to about single digit uh, pacemaker requirements even for the sapient. So the next generation uh, sapient will be on a sapient 3, but it will be preloaded and a much lower profile with the Exceller sheet coming down to about 14 French equivalent, which is a huge step uh, compared to say 18, 19 or 22 French device. We then come to Medtronic Coval. It has gone through a significant change again from the early generation to what we have now uh, and a much larger valve size uh, availability. The partner, uh, the COVAF US ID trial was the first trial to show in the high risk and inoperable group, Tabi to be superior, even up to three year follow up. But once again, there was something you give up. Uh, there was a higher, much higher need for pacemaker, almost 28% requirement of pacemaker. Re intervention again, 2.5%. And uh, parvalve leak, significantly higher, almost up to 7 to 8% of moderate severe when compared to surgery. So the Medtronic Evolute R then uh, was designed to have a more conformable uh, valve. Uh, because of the calcification, self-expanding technology is very dependent on what the anatomy uh, uh, is given. So the valve conforms the anatomy uh, and hopefully by doing that, it doesn't create pockets for parvalve leak. And the delivery system is, is now probably the most lowest profile delivery system for all TAVI devices uh, in that you can advise the valve sheetless, uh, removing the need for a sheet and that significantly drops the uh, requirement for excess size. And certainly in our unit, since the introduction of RR, our need for alternate excess, surgical excess, significantly dropped uh, from double digit to about single digit now. Uh, when we looked at the uh, outcome, uh, this, uh, we were fortunate to be part of all these trials. At 30 days, we had no major outcomes, uh, and even at one year, uh, one year mortality was down to 6.7%, which is probably one of the lowest 30 day mortality for a TAVI trial in this cohort of patients. And certainly when you look at, um, for the COVAF series, at least comparing to the earlier generation device to where we are now, it has significantly dropped in terms of 30 day outcome. So perhaps I think new, new devices with, with this iteration, better patient selection and the use of CT, I think is impacting on how these generation of devices help. And the key thing we've noticed was a significant drop in the need for pacemakers from 20% down to 11.7%. And again, I think by having the Evolute R with this resheatable feature allows you to deploy the valve slightly higher and if it's not good enough you can go slightly higher again and then you're not affecting the left bundle area and causing trauma to the left bundle. And again we were able to do a more detailed analysis of the patients who did get a pacemaker versus the one who didn't and deployment positioning was a key factor. So if you drop the deployment depth less than six millimeters that impacted on pacemaker need if you go slightly higher it reduces need for pacemaker. Parvalve leak again was reassuringly significantly better from the early trial design to about 3.4 to 4 percent or more to no severe. I think we can still go some way to get it better to surgical like results but certainly in this high risk group it is uh, it's acceptable I guess. So the next iteration was the size 34 valve. Right? Now, because 34 sounds massive for a surgical kind of valve but these valves expand to fit the space but it has increased our ability to treat much larger annulus from uh, 26 to 30 millimeter uh, diameter. The next generation Evolute R Pro should be available in about two, three months time. Certainly it's available, the trial's been completed in the US. This valve has an external skirt similar to the Sapien 3. And again, it's trying to address the power valve leak component of uh, one of the challenges with Tavi today. We come to Portico then, this is now what was owned by St. Jude's. St. Jude's now been bought over by Abbott, so it's a Abbott uh, Portico valve. Um, and it's an annular functioning valve, bovine leaflets, uh, and has a much larger configuration of cells that enables easy access to coronary artery, which will really have challenge and maybe a um, potential thing we need to look at once we start treating or if you start treating low moderate patients. And when we look at results, 30 day mortality and one year mortality, similar to the first generation to second generation. Uh, interchange. So this is uh, Abbott's or St. Jude's first uh, iteration uh, and when we look at power of leak, uh, I think slightly higher than what you'll expect today but for their first generation device between 5 to 6 percent of uh, moderate PBL with no severe. The next generation of Portico will be far more uh, compliant, uh, more deliverable 
And again, there is a sheetless technology coming and the uh, and addressing the power leak, it will have an external skirt, a dedicated external skirt uh, to match the Sapien and the Evolutar Pro. So finally then we come to the Boston Sign of Lotus Valve. This is a unique uh, device. It is very different from the self-expanding and certainly different from the balloon expandable. Uh, this device is uh, made from a mesh of nitinol and on, on uh, before uh, clipping it's a, a elongated device about 7 millimeter in diameter and it's mechanically compressed uh, to form the valve. Um, and it is the only valve today that uh, you can fully deploy it without releasing and when you release it, it, stay, it stays where it is. And if you do not like where it is, you can fully reposition it and release it again. So it has that very unique property. It also has a very unique skirt outside, which uh, bunches up to form a very, it's probably the best in class in terms of skirts for Power Valve Leak. And I'll show you some results on Power Valve Leak and why I say it. So in terms of 30 day outcome, similar to what I've shown before, um, uh, at 4.2% well, 30 day mortality, stroke 1.7, non discipline stroke 4.2, But that you do lose uh, in terms of need for second valve because it, it is truly a valve and when fully released or fully in position, you can fully decapture it. There was no need for a second valve at all compared to the Edo Sapien or even the Portico or the Avalodar. But you do lose something in exchange. Sorry, before I go to that, in terms of uh, power valve leak, it is the best in class. Uh, we do not see any mod, we do not see any severe. Even if you look at the mild, it's single digits or less. So. Uh, it has clear advantages in terms of power leak, but it has a significantly higher need for pacemaker. Uh, for 2016, 2017, the pacemaker rate is almost 25 to 28 percent. So I think there is something about having an external skirt and how it interacts uh, with the outflow uh, area. Again, uh, Boston has gone through a couple of iterations trying to deploy the valve a little higher, uh, and at present, uh, the company has withdrawn all its technology from the market due to uh, locking challenges. Uh, we hope that we will have this technology back in the market by the end of this year, early part of next year. This is what the next iteration should look like, is the Lotus Edge uh, and uh, it's supposed to be leaner, smaller, addressing uh, extra challenges, but uh, much larger uh, valve sizes as well and smaller valve sizes. So to summarize then, I think technology, technology advances uh, has possibly impacted on uh, TAVI outcomes. Um, I think the overall improvement outcome has been due to, I think, we've been better at page selection, we have been better at deploying the valves and getting access. Uh, but with each change in technology, I think we do need to change our technique in uh, deploying these cases and deploying the valves. But finally, I think no matter what you do, whatever technology you get, you really have to still pay attention on how you select your patients, how you do your procedure, uh, when you do it, who, with who you do it, and more importantly, following these patients after the procedure as well. I think those are key, key areas. Thank you.